Moving on to hypothesis testing. This is a long topic, so we're going to break it down into sections to make it easy to remember. Let's start with the basic question. What is a hypothesis? It is a statement about a value of a population. So basically, it is a forecast of some population parameter. For example, here we have a population, and we want to know the average age of the population. There are three types of hypotheses. Testing for equivalence, greater than, and less than. For example, analyst 1 believes the average age of the population is not equal to 18. Analyst 2 believes the average age is greater than 18, and the third analyst believes the average age is less than 18. The very first step in any hypothesis test is to state the hypothesis. H0 is the null hypothesis, and HA is the alternative hypothesis. A good trick to remember which is which is that whatever the analyst believes will become the alternative hypothesis. So, if analyst 1 believes the mean is not equal to 18, that is the alternative, and the null will be the opposite. Analyst 2 believes the mean is greater than 18, so the null is the opposite. We do the same for analyst 3. Pay attention to the signs when writing a hypothesis. Remember that the null hypothesis will always include some form of the equal sign. Now let's go over the big picture of what we're going to do in the next learning outcomes. If you understand the next few steps, you'll be able to solve any hypothesis test, no matter if it's a z-test, t-test, f-test, etc. Great. So, once you state the hypothesis, step number two is to visualize the graph to avoid making mistakes. Ask yourself, is it a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test? The easiest way to know is by looking at the alternative hypotheses. If it is testing for equality, it's a two-tailed test. If it is greater than, it's a right-tailed test. And if it's less than, it's a left-tailed test. Notice that these areas right here contain what's called the degree of confidence. For example, if the researchers want to test their hypotheses with 90% confidence, then these areas would be 90%. The probability that remains in the tails is 10%, which is also known as alpha. Notice how for the two-tailed test, we split alpha evenly between the two tails. But for the one-tailed tests, the entire value of alpha is contained in a single tail. So we visualize the graphs. But now what? How do we actually test the hypothesis? Well, let me give you a nice trick to remember the rest of the steps. Think of the area that contains the degree of confidence as the safe zone. The area in the tails will be the rejection zones. With that in mind, let's move on to step number three. Identify the critical values, which are also known as rejection points. The critical values are these points right here that mark off the area between the safe zone and the rejection zone. The critical values are found in one of these tables depending on the hypothesis but we'll get to that later. Lastly, we need to calculate a test statistic. You will calculate it by using data from a sample, but we'll get into the specifics later. What you need to know for now is that if the test statistic lands within the safe zone, we cannot reject the null hypothesis. However, if the test statistic lands anywhere within a rejection zone, we reject the null hypothesis. If you understand these big picture concepts, the rest of this chapter will be very simple. Here are the steps again. Pause the video if you need to review, and let's do a quick example to solidify these concepts. An analyst believes the return on the S&P 500 is greater than 8%. The population variance is 9, and he wants to test this at a 5% level of significance. To support the analysis, he takes a sample of 32 stocks from the population and finds the average return of the sample. Given this information, let's test the analyst's hypothesis. Step 1 is to state the hypothesis. He believes the population's mean is greater than 8, so that's the alternative hypothesis. The opposite will be the null hypothesis. Step 2 is to visualize the graph. Since the alternative hypothesis is greater than, 
we have a right tail test. The level of significance is 5%, so the degree of confidence must be 95%. The confidence interval is the safe zone, and the tail is the rejection zone. Step 3 is to identify the critical value. In this case, we will find it using the Z table because the population variance is known and assumed to be normal. If you don't remember how or when to use a Z table, you can go back to the reading titled Common Probability Distributions. The Z table gives you a critical value of 1.65. The last step is to calculate the test statistic. Here is the formula. And here are the labels. Pause the video if you want to solve it on your own before checking your work. By plugging in values, we get a test statistic of 1.89. Since it is greater than 1.65, meaning that it lands in the rejection area, we will reject the null hypothesis. Now that we've rejected the null, you can confidently say that the population's mean is above 8%. Okay, now let's go over a few key concepts before we continue with hypothesis testing. Take a look at this table. Ideally, if we do our hypothesis tests correctly, we would accept the null when it is true, and we would reject the null when it is false. If you reject the null when it is true, this is called a tight one error. Think of it like throwing away a good apple. It was good, but you still rejected it. If you accept the null when it is false, this is called a type 2 error. Think of it like eating a bad apple. It was bad, and yet you still fail to reject it. This scenario, where you correctly reject a false null, is also known as the power of a test, and it is equal to 1 minus the probability of a type 2 error. You should also be aware that statistical significance does not guarantee economic significance. For example, our hypothesis test may conclude that a given trading strategy generates positive returns. However, in the real world, once you factor in trading costs or taxes, then it doesn't really make sense economically. Another key term you should be familiar with is the p-value. It is the minimum level of significance at which we can reject the null hypothesis. The key here is to compare the p-value to the level of significance. If the level of significance is greater than or equal to the p-value, then you can reject the null hypothesis. This next learning outcome has to do with analyzing multiple tests. Here is why this is important. Let's assume that a test has a 10% level of significance. The alpha is the same as the probability of a false positive or a type 1 error, which is when you rejected a true null hypothesis. For example, if you draw 10 samples from a population for a hypothesis test 10% of the time, or 1 out of the 10 samples will be a false positive. So how can you fix this? Well, here's what you should do. Assume the alpha is 10% and 30 samples were drawn for a hypothesis test. The first step is to rank the p-values from lowest to highest. In this example, we had 30 samples and this column ranks the first five samples based on their p-values. The next step is to calculate this equation for each one. For the first row, alpha is equal to 10%. Its rank is 1 because it is the first item on the list and the number of tests is 30. Now, let's calculate this value for the remaining tests. In the last step, if the p-value is less than or equal to the value we calculated, then the test is significant. For this example, the first three tests are significant. All the remaining tests are not significant because the p-value is greater. This makes sense. Since the alpha was 10%, three samples out of the 30 are expected to have a false positive. At the beginning of the reading, we covered the basic steps for a hypothesis test. Now you just need to adapt them for the rest of the hypothesis tests that we will cover in this reading. It is very important that you understand that regardless of what test you are conducting, the four basic steps will remain the same. Depending on the test, the formulas to calculate the critical values or test statistics may differ.
but the basic steps do not change. So let's review each test individually, starting with the Z-test and T-test. The Z-test and the T-test are both used to test an analyst's forecasts about a population's mean. So here we have a single population, and we will take a sample to help us forecast the population mean. But how do you know when to use the Z-test or the T-test? Here is the table we talked about in the reading titled Sampling and Estimation. So for example, if the population is normally distributed, but you do not know its variance, you use the t-table to test the hypothesis. Going back to the summary sheet, the alternative hypothesis will be written as one of these three options. The analyst estimates that the population mean is equal to, greater than, or less than, a given value. Once you have stated the hypothesis, you need a critical value and a test statistic. You're either going to use the z-table or the t-table to find the critical values. And finally, these are the formulas for the test statistics. The only difference is that the z-test uses the population standard deviation and the t-test uses the sample standard deviation. Be careful that you don't accidentally input a variance into this formula instead of a standard deviation. There are no other requirements. This is all the information you need to be able to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. So for example, assume you conducted a right-tailed z-test. This was the z-value, and this was the value of the test statistic. Since the test statistic lands in the tail, which we know is the rejection zone, you would have to reject the null hypothesis. The next test is the f-test, which is used when you have two populations and you want to make assumptions about the equality of their variances. These are the three possible alternative hypotheses. Their variances could be equal, or one could be greater than the other. For this test, the population must be normally distributed, and the samples taken from each population must be independent. So watch out, if these requirements are not met, then the test will not work. The test statistic is the ratio of the sample variances, and remember that the numerator is the larger of the two sample variances. And finally, the critical value is found in the f-table. The degrees of freedom needed to use the f-table are based on the size of each sample. And just like any other test, you would reject the null hypothesis if the test statistic falls within a rejection zone. Now, let's talk about the chi-squared test. This is used when you have one population and you want to make assumptions about its variance. These are the three possible alternative hypotheses. You are not comparing it with anything. You are simply stating that the variance could be equal to, greater than, or less than some predicted value. The population must also be normally distributed. The critical value is found on the chi-squared table, which uses the degrees of freedom. And the test statistic is found with this formula, which is based on the sample variance and the population variance. Next, we have the difference in means test. This is used when you have two populations and you want to test the equality of their means. This test assumes that the two populations' variances are equal. These are the three possible alternative hypotheses. It is taking the difference between the two population means to test their equality. The populations must be normally distributed, and the samples taken from those populations must be independent. If they are not, then you have to use a paired comparisons test, which we'll talk about later on. The test statistic is usually given, but here is the formula, which uses a term called the pooled variance. The critical value is found on the t-table, but pay extra attention to the formula for the degrees of freedom. Now, let's look at the mean differences, or paired comparisons test. This is when we have two populations with dependent samples, and we want to make assumptions about the mean of their differences. The alternative hypothesis is a forecast on what the mean of their differences is. But what does that mean exactly? Let's say our populations are the monthly returns of stock 1 and stock 2 over the last decade. The stocks are in the same industry, that's why their samples will be dependent.
Now, let's take a sample from each population and write down the monthly returns of each sample. We then subtract them to get the monthly difference between the samples. Now, all you have to do is get the average of these sample differences and the standard deviation of these differences. You will see why we need these values in one moment. The critical value is found in the t-table, and here is the formula for the test statistic. This value here is the mean of the sample differences. This value here is just the standard deviation of the sample differences. That's why we calculated them at the beginning. And finally, this value is the population's mean difference, which you'll find in the alternative hypothesis. The curriculum briefly covers the Pearson correlation test, which is used to make assumptions about a population's correlation coefficient. This is the hypothesis, the test statistic, and the requirements for the critical value. Remember that the test statistic uses the sample correlation coefficient. Sometimes, the data being analyzed is not suitable for the tests we have discussed in this reading. That's why nonparametric tests exist. For example, nonparametric tests are often used when the necessary distribution requirements are not met, when the data is in ranks instead of values, when there are outliers, or when the hypothesis does not concern a population parameter. A very common nonparametric test is the Spearman rank correlation test. It is used to test correlation when the population is not normally distributed. This test ranks observations within a sample and compares those rankings to another samples. Now let's wrap up this reading by reviewing contingency tables. Take a look at this table. It categorizes securities by the type of investment and by their size. We need to test whether there is a correlation between the size and investment type. But because we are analyzing categorical data, parametric tests will not work. So we need a non-parametric test that can test for independence. These are the null and the alternative hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis states that size and investment type are not independent. Next are the critical values, which are found on the chi-square table. For the degrees of freedom, R is the number of rows, and C, the number of columns, which in this case is three rows and three columns. You also need a test statistic, which is found with this formula. M is the number of cells in the table, which in this case is nine. O is the number of observations in each cell. And E is the expected number of observations in each cell. Let's use this cell as an example. O is equal to 30, and the expected value is calculated as the column total times the row total divided by the overall total. This type of test will always be a right-tailed test. So the last step would be to compare the critical value and test statistic to see if you need to reject the null hypothesis. It would be a good idea to review all the hypothesis tests from this reading together to make sure you know which test to use when. We have compiled all the tests into the next two summary sheets. Feel free to pause the video and take any notes you need. This is the end of the reading. Well done. For more videos like these, go to wallstreetnotes.com and master the entire CFA curriculum by watching simple animated videos.